so we landed and I got out and I got the grenades and I clipped them onto my, my vest and, uh, and got my, my M4 off of the dash and I was ready to go. And I was like, just, I looked at him and I was just about to unplug the helmet. And he's like, ALT, one last thing, make sure the ammo crates aren't booby trapped. And then I was like, Click. I'm like, booby trapped. I'm like, I don't know how to tell if ammo crates are booby trapped. Welcome to Critical Angle. My name's Ian McCarthy, and I'm very excited to bring our guest in today, Mr. Stephen Irving. He's a good friend of mine and former colleague. He's retired U.S. Army 27 years in. Uh, he flew the OH-58 Kiowas and then later the H-64 Apaches, and I can't wait to get into some stories about that. But uh, first things first, Stephen, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Ian. Before we kind of get into the aviation side, let's go back a little bit and let's talk about when you joined the Army you're a young guy, you're infantry, you know, what was that experience like? And also, you know, talk to us a little bit about that transition going from green to gold. You went the commission route to become a pilot. So I, uh, let's see, uh, I wasn't the best high school student and I wasn't really into that, but I knew ever since an early age that I wanted to be in the military. Um, my grandfather served in World War II and D-Day. My dad was a Vietnam uh, Cobra pilot. Um, so I knew it was something I wanted to do. So I, um, it was 1993, and before I even graduated high school, in fact, I already had a contract signed with the Army, and uh, two weeks after graduating high school, I actually, the recruiter came and picked me up at the house, um, took me down to the New Haven, Connecticut uh, train station. I took a train from, uh, and this sounds real old-timey, doesn't it, uh, but took a, took a train from New Haven, Connecticut to Atlanta, Georgia. And then a bus to Fort Benning, Georgia, to start uh, infantry basic training down there. Oh, man. Yeah. So, you know, right out of high school, just going right into what was your uh, MOS? So it was 11 Bravo at that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just I straight just, up infantry. I, I remember standing outside the recruiting office with my dad, and he said, Look, you know, I mean, I was in the Army. The Army's a great outfit, but uh, sure you don't want to join the Air Force, you know? And I'm like, No, dad, I, I want to. I want to, you know, I want to serve. I want to run around in the woods and, you know, be, be tough. And, uh, that's just what I want to do. And, um, uh, he even tried to talk me into flying in the army at that point too. And I was dead set on infantry. So that's what I signed up for. So how long did you do that? And what, what was the kind of turning point where you, you know, did you look at a, a pilot and you're like, man, I need to be doing that job or something. How did, how did that kind of come about? There was an aha moment like that. So I was eight years in. I was an E6 in the infantry. Um, I think I was serving at Fort Drum at the at that point, and we were on a rotation down in Louisiana um, at Fort Polk. It's called JRTC Joint Readiness Training Center. Then you'll go, your unit will go down there and do um, six to eight week rotations. Uh, they call it in the box down there. So you you're in a simulated deployed combat environment. And, you know, they make it as real as you can. Yeah, um, there's no showers, you're living in the field, you're just applying uh, face paint over old dirty face paint from the week before, you know, and uh, we were getting close to the end and there was, um, I was in a light infantry company, we were in a, you always finish up the exercise in a defensive perimeter. And um, the, the opposing force, the, the make, make believe enemy, uh was a battalion size element we were a company size element they attacked us they overran us and i remember at that point i i was in a grass field it was i was kneeling the grass was up to my chin and i had a 249 machine gun that i had picked up from someone that was killed you know in the exercise we had the laser miles gear on and i was just shooting across the field and all of a sudden uh two kiowas just came screaming over the treetops and just let loose on the enemy um, 
advancing across the field with both with their 50, 50 caliber Gatlin guns, um, just let loose on them and killed a bunch of them. You could see them all make believe and fall down dead. Um, and I looked up at the Kiowa and he had doors off and I could see that the pilot had a, had a really fresh, bright green flight suit on. I could see the side of his neck was clean and freshly shaven and just everything about it just looked clean, crisp. And he, he let loose on the, uh, on the 50 cals, finished his gun run and then peeled off and headed back to base. And that was it. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? I, I'm, I'm, I've, been, <laughs> I've been in the woods here. I haven't showered in, in three weeks. I'm exhausted. You know, that's what I need to be doing. That That's definitely where the action yeah, is. Yeah, these guys are going back to base and showering, right? <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 you know, by the time, like, like we're still cleaning up the massacre here in the field. And they're, they're going to be having ice cream at the chow hall. It's funny because I've talked to so many folks who went like enlisted to warrant or enlisted officer, you know, in aviation. And it's, it's all the same story where they looked at somebody like, I'm in the wrong job. Yeah, yeah. You decided, all right, I want to be doing that job. What was, what'd you do to, in, in order to achieve that? Well, I knew as an enlisted man, you, you couldn't fly. So the only option at that point was to become an officer. And um, there were two career tracks. One was, um, you know, the warrant officer track and then the commission officer track. Um, even though my dad was a retired warrant officer, um, that was many, many decades ago and things had changed the whole application process and everything. And he had been kind of unassociated with the army for, for many, many years. Um, so the warrant officer tract wasn't as easy for me to gain knowledge on and, and, and kind of find a way into at that point. Um, the commit, I, I knew I wanted to be commissioned. So really ROTC or OCS were, were really the only option. So I, I put in a green to gold package. And um, back in those days, when you were driving around post, you would see the signs pegged in the grass, become an officer, green to gold. I called the number. I told them what I wanted to do, um, either stay in the infantry as an officer or fly as an officer. And um, and they started, they said, look, uh, based off of where you're at now, I had two years of college already. Uh, they said, uh, all you need to do is complete another two years and apply to schools, get accepted in an ROTC program, and you can go that route. Or you can go to OCS, Officer Candidate School down in Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, that's a much more rigorous, uh, uh, much longer program, and you have less influence on selecting the branch you want. It's boarded versus a little more, you have a little more control over it in the ROTC route. The tiers of college, did you get that in that uh, eight years that you were enlisted? Yeah, I did uh, what they called E-Army-U back then. It was a... Um, uh, basically on, on weekends, you would go to the education center on post and go to classes. And then there was some online material too, to just knock out base credits. Yeah. So you got, you needed two more years of college. I assume you kind of did the same thing with those two years. No. So there, I, I actually, um, I applied to, uh, UConn university of Connecticut. Um, I applied to VMI, Virginia Military Institute, and then uh, Cornell University in upstate New York. And I, I think VMI wanted me to take some summer classes for an additional language, and I just didn't have the time to do that to stay with the program. So that was out. And then, uh, and they also didn't offer a scholarship. Um, UConn accepted me and offered me a full ride. Um, but I opted to go to Cornell in upstate New York. It was a very small program and they offered me a full scholarship for the training. And um, because they had a very small ROTC program, they were really looking for candidates That's uh, awesome. actively. And they liked the fact that I had prior military experience because um, they needed a senior cadet to help with their program as well. As well. And the fact that I was an NCO before helped. It was this after you already separated from the army or did you, were you still active duty? No. So when, back then, when, uh, when you did it, when you were accepted into green to gold, and then you could show that you were accepted into a college ROTC program, uh, they would essentially, um, I believe it was a, a military chapter. It was a, it was a, uh, release from your active duty service to pursue educational goals. So they take you off of active duty you sign into a National Guard unit where you're you're aligned with a local uh, National Guard unit, basically the one that is closest to the college you're going to. 
So uh, as soon as I was, I was accepted into the Cornell ROTC program, I moved to upstate New York. Um, they give you some time to move. Um, and I was assigned to a infantry national guard unit in, uh, in Ithaca, New York, which was about 15 minutes up the road. And another, I actually ended up deploying uh, with that unit uh, on 9-11 as well. So, uh, cause we were very, we, we actually deployed down to New York city with that national guard unit. So I actually lost an entire year of schooling. Uh, oh, so this is like right in the middle. 9-11 is right in the middle of your Right in the middle call. of 9-11. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, that, that's a, actually a really cool program that because I was you know, kind of wondering, like, well, how do they, you know, what are you supposed to do this while you're, you know, active duty or whatever? But that's that's kind of neat that they support that, you know? Yeah. And, and it's um, it's a good program, too, because while you're a cadet, I mean, you're, you're a normal full time uh, college student. Um, so your ROTC obligations is you'll have a, uh, you'll have every day, you'll have an ROTC class that you'll go to, and it'll be an hour or two lecture where you'll discuss military topics with a major Lieutenant Colonel or full, full bird Colonel, or one of the master sergeants will teach you the ROTC cadre. And then, uh, you'll have your ROTC lab later that day where for one, two, three hours that day, everyone in the ROTC battalion will get together and you'll do physical fitness you'll do uh, uh, drilling ceremonies uh, maybe you'll do a series of hands-on training for like land navigation weapons training hand-to-hand -hand combat whatever the topic is so at what point in this process so you you've gone through the college pro program the rtc when do you kind of find out that you get the aviation track that you kind of that you were desiring on that so um, a normal ROTC program is four years, right? Uh, freshman through senior. Um, you learn basic military skills those first two years, almost like a private or an enlisted soldier would. And then that third and fourth year, uh, the cadets get into more um, like leadership, uh, unit management, that type of stuff. Um, at the completion of your third year of the program, you'll go to what they call advanced camp. I think they call it something different now, but uh, you'll fly out to um, Joint Base Lewis McCord or Fort Lewis up in Washington State, and you'll be up there for two months during the summer. So during this period, um, every cadet in every ROTC program across the United States goes to Fort Lewis during for this advance camp. And I would say there's probably six or 800 cadets all formed in this massive unit. And during the eight weeks you're there, you're formed into companies, platoons, squads, teams. Uh, a cadet will be assigned as the brigade commander all the way down to a squad leader. And then you'll flip flop positions while you're there. While you're there, you're evaluated on um, physical fitness, uh, leadership, peer evaluations, land navigation, uh, marksmanship, every skill, that a, a soldier or officer should have. And at the end of it, all this gets fed into an Excel spreadsheet to form an order of merit list. Um, so you, you would pick your top three uh, wishes. So I think mine were actually uh, aviation, infantry, and uh, intelligence. And when you get back sometime in the middle of the semester uh, during your senior year, uh, ROTC Cadet Command will have filtered all that order and merit list down, and you'll have a uh, branch award day where your unit will, your ROTC unit will get together, and they'll open up the envelope and see what you got. Yeah, I actually, I have a. Let me see if I can find something real quick. I have a. Uh, this kind of the nostalgia brings me back here. So I, this is my. Uh, this is actually my field notebook, and inside it. Inside this, I put my aviation wings to motivate me to fight hard for my branch every day. Sweet, man. So this is what I had senior year in college in my cargo pocket every day at a leadership camp. You can see inside I had a uh, protractor for my map and then a couple of cheater cards for medevac and call for fire. Nice. So, so you so yeah. you graduated college at a ROTC and are you just reporting straight to Fort Rucker for flight training or how does, what's the process like on that? Yeah, so you uh, you get awarded your branch, you complete college your fourth year, you um, 
you uh, pin your uh, your butter bar on one side and then your branch insignia on the other side. You're legitimately an officer. And then you just wait for Army Human Resources to assign you on orders. Um, you know, based off of where you're, your branch, where you're going to go. So uh, formerly Fort Rucker, now known as Fort Novacell, is uh, is the home of Army Aviation. And um, I think I came down on orders maybe for June of June of 2004 uh, for, for then Fort Rucker to begin flight school. Now, did you have any prior flight experience prior to going down there to Rucker before you touched controls in an aircraft? That is a great question. Um, so it, interestingly enough, so um, even when I was in ROTC, I was scared to death to fly. If I had, I was scared to death. If I had to go on an airplane just for a normal family trip or something, um, I would, you know, when the airplane's taking off, bumps in route, landing, I was terrified, white knuckling the armrests of the chair and everything. (laughs) I was scared to death, scared to death of it. So while I was in college, I, um, this is even before advanced camp, before I decided I wanted, I didn't want to go infantry anymore. I, um, I said, well, if, if I am interested in aviation, I need to, you know, get comfortable with it. So I drove up 15 minutes up the road from, from, uh, Cornell and went to my local, uh, airport, the County airport where they had a learn to fly sign and jumped in a Cessna 152 built in the 1960s and went on my discovery flight. And once the instructor, the CFI gave me the, you know, the yoke and the pedals and everything, I, uh, I was like, wow, this thing, like, it wants to fly, you know, and I'm just helping it fly clean. And it's, it's not like a helicopter, just, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not going to fall out of the sky like a helicopter. Yeah. So, um, I got hooked immediately on it. And then I, I was like, where do I sign up? How can I just fly this all the time? They're like, well, you can get your private pilot license. So I pursued and paid out of pocket, um, just part 61, my, uh, my private pilot license while I was in college. How many of your classmates, uh, had prior flight experience or were a bunch of them just coming in just completely, you know, oblivious to anything aviation? So I I think, um, probably 90% had never flown an aircraft before, maybe 85%. Um, my roommate was a CF double I in helicopters. Um, luckily enough. So he, he was ready to pass his final check ride day one. So great, great guy. Um, but, uh, the majority of folks, you know, maybe some people had some airplane experience like me, or I at least knew what it's like to be in a small aircraft and talk on the radio. And I knew about airspace and traffic patterns and that helps how to, how to do a quick instrument scan, you know, um, the, the vast majority, I, I think you could safely say 80% never been in a light aircraft before. So your roommate, the double I, is this guy just getting roasted uh, because he already knows how to fly? Was it, was he a helicopter double I? They, I mean, they're, you know, I mean, you know, as well, I do any instructor is thrilled to get someone with a lot of experience sure. as opposed to none, yeah. you know, but, um, uh, they were ready to offer him a job, you know, and like, Hey, instead of going to your unit, why don't you just stay here? You know, he, he did really great. And he helped me out a lot too. When I had questions after training for the day, he would give me, I mean, it, in the end, it, it was frustrating because every night or on, on Friday night or the weekends when I was staying in studying and chair flying and stuff, he was going to the beach in Panama City with his girlfriend. But um, but he was there to, to help me a lot, too, and, and a lot of questions I had early on. No, I feel like that's super lucky to have that resource because it's, it's one thing if you got two guys coming up from nothing trying to learn together. But if you already have somebody that knows what they're doing, I mean, bouncing questions off them, that's that's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So your uh, the first aircraft you flew in, because you guys got a before you even touch the aircraft, you've got a ton of don't they they front end load you with a ton of ground stuff. Yeah, you do all the ground up front, um, and it's lecture style, probably um, really nice facilities there. Um, uh, just like going to college, it's basically an aviation college um, with you know 100 150 people in one classroom, and uh, you, you'll do you know start off with basic systems uh on and, and uh pre-flight and traffic pattern and the instruments and just all the basic pri- private pilot stuff so you the the phases are you uh start off in primary 
uh, training, which is basically just private pilot level tasks. Uh, then you go to your instrument phase and then you go to, um, when I went through, they referred, you would, the first two, the primary and the instruments were in the TH-67 or the, the 206B. Uh, uh, and then you would transition over to the OH-58 uh, Alpha Charlie um, into what they called BNAV or basic navigation. So that was you and an instructor flying around with a paper map, no GPS, just doing uh, uh, cross country or um, uh, tactical level uh, navigation to like find landing zones or find airports. You went from private pilot fixed wing to rotorcraft. I've gone the other way, you know, cause I got my PPL add on way late in the helicopter game. Did you feel like that airplane skill kind of motor skill wise? I mean, obviously the airspace you know, was easy, but motor skill, do you think that that helped you, you know, learning helicopters at all? Yeah, I think because any aircraft, it's about management of of power, you know, um, whether it's engine power or lift or airspeed or, you know, uh, climbs and descents. It's it's just management of the of power and the and the airframe itself. So um, I mean, flaring and landing in an airplane is kind of very similar to flaring at the end of an auto in a helicopter. You know, it's the same principle, really. So it, it definitely helped. And, and for somebody looking to pursue uh, rotary, I mean, I, I think going fixed wing maybe first just to kind of put your toe in the water um, isn't a bad idea. I mean, the only the only thing I have against that is if you're if you're trying to be a professional helicopter pilot, you know, which is usually the CFI route, you want as many rotor adders as you can get because you're going to need that 200 in Robbie's anyways. You know what I mean? So it's like, do you want to spin? I mean, I always recommend people because I hear that all the time, but I always recommend just go, if you want to be a helicopter pilot, be a helicopter pilot. You know, if, if you want to add an airplane for fun, okay. But, you know, if, if money's tied, I mean, it's, it ain't cheap to, <laughs> to go all the way, you know? I feel so. like the, the fixed wing gave me a leg up maybe the first month or two. And then after that, everyone's on the same level. Right. But that's a big deal, right? You get your your solo yeah. cap, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know all that stuff. Yeah, and yeah getting yeah, the yeah. solo. You don't want to be the last guy that's soloing out there. You know? Yes, yeah, just having been in a in an aircraft by yourself the first time, you know. Yeah, that's a huge. Yeah, because because yeah. y'all's y'all's solo, is it really a solo? Is is it just two students up in the aircraft or? Yeah. So. Um... No, it was you and your stick buddy. Yep. But you, you're never really by yourself, right? In the army? Never by yourself. No, no. The only time, I think there was a short period when I was after flight school and everything, when I was in the unit where um, maintenance test pilots would go up by themselves. But then that changed where they had to have somebody else on board. Even then there was a period where they could take a crew chief with them just to have somebody else. And, um, and now I, I think some units it went to just two pilots is what it had to be. Cause man, it's a different, even if it's another student, it's a totally different thing, right? When you're, you're, you look over, there's nobody in this aircraft and it's just you, man. Oh I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's eerie. Yeah. So yeah. you, you go through flight school, um, you get to the end kind of merit based, just like ROTC where, you know, did you get your number one pick? I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I graduated, um, number two in my flight class, which I was pretty happy of. I don't know Heck how that yeah, happened, man. but, but it did number two. And, um, was your roommate number one or what? <laughs> He was not number one. He wasn't. Uh oh. No, he shouldn't have got on the beach so much. <laughs> I know. Well, no, it's because he was like everything else. It was physical fitness and peer evals and um, you know leadership. And you're put in various leadership positions, and and, and then there's a whole tactical side to it too. So that I mean, flight school, uh, you've got the the you go primary instruments, then you go basic navigation, then you go um, uh, to a uh, then you go to your advanced airframe training where you start learning that airframe and then eventually tactics where you do single ship taxes, uh, tactics, uh, multi-ship anywhere from two to four to six to a, maybe a company of eight or 10, uh, helicopters all conducting, uh, operations together. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but why the Kiowa, why was that the pick? So I was number two in the class and, um, the way they do it is you you're all brought into a room all like 180 of you or something and there's a a whiteboard up at the front and they'll have a magnet of of every single aircraft available and, and it'll be like a little apache or a little kiowa or a little blackhawk and they put them all up there and they're like all right number one on the order of merit is you know johnson and johnson gets up and and claims their aircraft off the board and everyone claps and then she goes back to her seat 
you know. So that's cool that you get to straight up pick it. It's not like, oh, give us your top three or something. It's just like no, you, you literally walk off the board. And some sometimes there'll only be like two Apaches, two Kiowas, everything else is Blackhawk. And if you're like the number five or six guy, you know, they're, they're sitting there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're nervous. You know, yeah. yeah, like don't pick it. Like, look, I will straight up murder you if you pick, <laughs> if you pick the last Apache off there, you know, seriously. No. But, uh, and because it's all based off of, I mean, they, they uh, the Army Aviation Headquarters goes to all the units and they do planning. They say, look, this is how many Apache guys we need. This is how many Blackhawk guys we need over the next year or two. These are the slots we need to fill uh, for all the vacancies in the units. So it's not the same every class, you know, but my class, I, I it was it was pretty evenly spread across all four airframes. There were even a couple of fixed wing slots. Fixed wing was an option. Um, and uh, uh, I, I just went right up and, and grabbed the, uh, the first Kiowa off the board. And by that time, flight school was 13 months long from start to finish. And I was ready to leave Fort Rucker. And really, ex- I, I, at that point, I knew I was going to Fort Campbell with the 101st Airborne that was about to deploy to Iraq. So I was really excited about that. I wanted to get out of there, get in the airframe and get into the fight. And I also, I remembered my experience from training where I saw the Kiowas come over the field and I wanted to be close to the infantry and direct support of the infantry as well. So those were kind of the reasons that I, that I picked that. I I know um, if you went the Apache route, that was, I think that was in three months extra, like three months longer than the Kiowa advanced training. So how was, how long was that Kiowa advanced training that you had to do after you picked it? I think at that point it was, I think it was three months. And I think the Apache one was, I want to say the Apache was like five months or something. Okay. And, That's not too bad. really. No. Th- and the reason is, is all the advanced avionics, you know, um, the avionics themselves. And you got to really learn the, the front seat and the back seat are, have a lot, a lot of differences between the two uh, versus left and right in the Kiowa in the Kiowa, but the systems take a long time. How soon after completing this training are we deploying? So I, uh, let's see, I, I finished up the Kiowa course at Fort Rucker and took two weeks of leave, I think, and moved up to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, I drove up to my unit and uh, everybody, when I first went into the unit, I was assigned a 217 CAV in the 101st CAV at Fort Campbell. And uh, everyone was on leave right before deployment. So there was... Uh, the only person there was the major, the S3, and his master sergeant. And they're like, all right, lieutenant. Yeah, welcome. Uh, well, we got you on the roster. Uh, pack your shit because we're going. You know, you got, oh, about a, yeah, you got about two weeks before we go. So everyone at that point had already been on uh, two of four weeks given of pre-deployment leave. So I was there at maybe two weeks before I got on. Uh, it was time to come back and deploy to Iraq. So this is what time? What what year is this? This was uh oh this was the summer of oh five, I think. And this particular unit had just gotten back from OIF one, which was you know, the initial deployment into Iraq, uh destroying the Republican Guard and you know, dismantling Saddam's regime. Um so this was they had deployed over there, come back. Um and then it was a fairly quick turnaround before we were going over for OIF-2, which was really the beginning of uh, the, the, those Republican Guard members that were you know, destroyed were beginning to form the insurgency that we came to know. So the whole thing was shifting at that point. Yeah. Oh, five, man. That's, that was a pretty uh, hot time. So, I mean, you get over there. I mean, how much are you guys flying? You're probably flying a ton in the Kiowa. Yeah. It, um, so we would, uh, from, I believe in that deployment, we, uh, we flew the aircraft down to Jacksonville and then they went on a barge. And so we actually deployed them via ships. Um, and then they would, um, go into the, the port of Kuwait, I believe called Doha. And we would offload them from the ships there and then fly the uh, all 30 OH-58s in the squadron, unfold the blades, and TP would, or the maintenance test pilot would give it a thumbs up. And uh, uh, we would fly all 30 in like 
groups of groups of 10, I think, from uh, Doha, Kuwait, up into uh, up into I, th I think that that one was um, it was actually uh, Samara, Iraq. Yeah, called it was called Fab McKinsey Samara, Iraq, out of uh, near near Balad. So how long was that first deployment in uh, 05? That was 12 months. 12 months. So during that 12 months, do you have like a general mission or is it kind of changing on a constant basis or what's what's kind of a normal day in the life of a Kiowa pilot in 05? So the, the normal day, I mean, the the, the job is um, to find, fix and destroy the enemy using all, all means necessary, right? So you're a scout pilot. So your primary task is reconnaissance and that could be um, uh, route reconnaissance uh, of supply lines or security routes um, could be area reconnaissance of local towns cities uh, critical infrastructure sites um, and uh, or just zone reconnaissance where we think there's an enemy camp in generally this area and you're flying around almost just kind of just doing s turns across a vast area um, for hours searching for any signs of enemy activity or uh, weapons or anything like that or really just a deterrence right yeah and so instead of like you know a black hawk going here and picking these people up or going here or whatever you guys are just kind of loitering around and i mean it's kind of a different style of flying i'd imagine probably a lot of fun it is yeah the um i mean you have complete freedom because you're, you're right like the 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 Blackhawks and the Chinooks, they're absolutely um, critical to everything. I mean, moving in people and food and supplies, um, but they're mostly A to B to C to D and then back to A, right? Uh, flying ring routes. Um, but we would we would show up. So we'd always fly in a team of two. So it'd be your you and your co-pilot and, uh, and then your sister ship. And usually it would be like an experienced guy with a new guy in each aircraft. Good crew mix. So... Typically, a typical squadron, um, we would fly three or four um, scout weapon teams per day. So it's called a SWT or a, a pair of Kiowas. And um, let's say team one would show up, uh, they would have the, uh, the uh, six to 12 shift, right? So between six and 12 is your kind of your mission period. Now there's breakfast or shower and breakfast and uh, briefings and pre-flight and everything else that needs to happen outside of that. But that six to 12 would be like your mission window. Um, so you would go into the operations center, you would, um, get a, uh, get a, uh, updates from the air force weather officer on what weather is going on in Iraq. You would get a, uh, intelligence report from the intelligence officer on an enemy activity last 24, next 24, and then what he wants you to go look for. Um, and then the operate the battle captain or the operations officer would tell you Here, here's what your task is today and it could be several things it would be hey from uh 6 a.m to 8 a.m we want you to uh conduct route reconnaissance up route chicken uh in order to uh detect or uh, uh deny the emplacement of ieds along that route so you're looking for strange things in the route or dig marks or people milling around the route uh, during that time period. And then after that, the second half of your period, we want you to go up to this village way up in the Northwest quadrant and conduct area reconnaissance of that village. We want you to look for, uh, uh, gathering, uh, males gathering, um, any signs of weapons, any signs of meetings, any signs of pickup trucks that may have weapon mounts in the beds, um, any signs of, you know, IED manufacturing. Um, and you can actually, you can, from the Kiowa, you can find all of these things, you know, just like in a Robbie flying low, it's amazing what you can see from the air. Yeah. Cause you can, I mean, how, how high are you guys flying these, most of these recon missions? Much, much lower than we fly in the States, you know? So, I mean, you're, so I, we've pro you and I have probably had this conversation before, yeah, but hey, Steve, sure. we need to pick it up a little bit, but <laughs> the, um, I, and, and, you know, I mean, it's army aviation, you fly low level nap of the earth and, when we're flying around out there, there really is no minimum altitude. Um, if anything, to be quite honest, there was a maximum altitude a lot of times because the maximum altitude, well, it would go back and forth uh, throughout different tours. But uh, so, you know, initially we would use flying low level as a way to uh, 
you know, just detect visibility to uh, reduce our noise signature and to gain the element of surprise um, while we're moving up on these, these uh, possible enemies. Um, also, I mean, you get the closer you are, the better you can see and detect and identify things too. But also the closer they can see you too, right? So, I mean, is small arms fire and, you know, AK-47 fire a concern, you know, for you guys? Yeah, and there was a lot of back and forth over the deployments because I did a series of five deployments with 101st. And, you know, the enemy evolved, the fight evolved, and our tactics evolved back and forth. So there would always be this, what is the sweet spot for us to fly? Is it, you know, no lower than 100 feet and no higher than 500 feet? Because you want to stay at a max effective range of some small arms, but then you want to um, also not expose the aircraft to surface air missile threats as well. So, which were out there. And because, I mean, the Kiowa is decent speed. It's probably, you know, similar to the 407, about 130 knots or so. So you're not... You're not really a speed demon. In fact, with the with the doors off, uh, VME was 110. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, being low, yeah, like you said, you're exposing the aircraft for for less time. You know, by by the time you go over that hill or whatever. So, so walk us walk us through if you can some some interesting uh, memorable missions in the in the Kiowa that you have. Oh man, um, let's see. I'll try to go chronologically, but I, I do remember one. Um, so we were in in Iraq and uh first deployment i was a brand new lieutenant and i was flying left seat with a i think he was a w5 at that point really senior guy really cool guy and um uh we were there was a large air assault going on where in it we we assaulted an infantry company i think into this really um a town that was just ridden with al-qaeda and we, uh, the infantry unit uh, established a cordon or encircled the village and then began, uh, you know, interrogating and, and interviewing all the males. And we're finding some that um, were wanted persons or who would swipe test positive for explosives or they found possessing IED materials, whatever. So they were detaining a lot of people. And we were f flying security on the outer cordon to, to while the infantry unit was processing all these people in this village um uh we were flying the outer layer of security just to provide that that blanket of security for the infantry force on the ground and really it's just as simple as we'd have one ship low doing a circle maybe clockwise and the other ship flying counter counterclockwise up high and lead and trail are both talking to each other and um, if lead sees lead's primary purpose is to detect anything unusual or identify anything that may be a threat to the ground unit and trails primary purpose is to protect lead so if lead says hey i see this or hey you know here's there's somebody with a weapon trail is immediately in a position to place rockets or machine gun fire down on that threat so lead can escape um so on this particular mission um while we were circling we identified a cave and we told the ground commander about the cave and at that point and and we believed we saw crates um near the uh uh crates near the um uh entrance to the cave so we uh um landed told the ground commander about it and he said look that, that's great but i that's a little on the outside of the village i don't have time to, uh, I, I don't have the time or the resources or men available right now to get over there to exploit that cave. And we suspected it was a weapons cache of, uh, it looked like uh, cases of RPG rounds and you could see ammo tins of 762 in there and everything. But he said he just didn't have the resources to get to it. So we got back, I, I got back in the helicopter and we took off and continued our loop. Um, but the, uh, the uh, ground commander gave us uh, a few uh, thermite grenades, white phosphorus grenades. So since he didn't have the resources to deal with it, the W-5 put it on me and said, hey, Lieutenant, here's what we're going to do. We're going to land and we're going to, uh, you're going to get out and you're going to go toss these white phosphorus oh, into the cave on top of the ammo crates and then, and then run back and then, and then, uh, you know, and then we'll get out of there before everything blows up. I'm like, all right, sounds like a plan. You know, this is my first deployment. What did I know, you know? 
And uh, and this guy, he had been through OIF one and maybe Panama or something too. I don't know. Yeah, but he was maybe, more experienced. Maybe than me. <laughs> yeah, maybe Vietnam. I don't know. So so we landed, and I got out, and I got the grenades, and I clipped them onto my my vest, and uh, and got my my M4 off of the dash, and I was ready to go. And I was like, just I looked at him, and I was just about to unplug the helmet, and he's like, ALT, one last thing, make sure the ammo crates aren't booby trapped. And then I was like, Clip. I'm like, booby trapped. I'm like, I don't know how to tell if ammo crates are booby trapped. I'm like, what the hell? This just feels wrong. And here I am, I'm on foot. And then, so like, you feel like king of the world when you're up above the enemy town circling it. But now I'm on foot approaching this cave with my rifle, you know, and I'm like, this is a terrible idea. This is it. This is how I'm going out, you know? Yeah, you're like, I'm supposed to be a pilot. I'm supposed to be a pilot, yeah. man. <laughs> I'm like, I, that's the whole thing. I got out of the infantry deliberately. And now here I am rushing a cave to go blow up stuff, you know? So I did it. I went up there and I and I remember I was like, watch out for booby traps. So I looked around. I didn't see anything that looked like a booby trap. And I didn't touch <laughs> anything. And, and I just popped these things and quicker than anything and threw them on there and ran back to the helicopter. And the whole thing started to catch fire and blow up and we took off and got out of there. So I don't think we ever told anybody about it. And uh, cause I don't know if that was, you know, the rules were still being written as far as what we could and could not do back then. It's there's a little bit of wild west factor. That sounds like a very tactical hold my beer moment, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that was, that was it. Yeah. Um, that was, that was probably my first experience where it was, uh, like wow what the hell what, what am i doing so did that cw5 did he let you do a lot of the a lot of the stick flying yeah i mean some guys are better than others i don't remember specifically um a lot of those guys they're at the point where like if you were to go fly with a student today you wouldn't care who flew you know i mean you've you've gotten your you've gotten your fill you know as long as they're i, I think a lot of the senior guys they would say look like yeah you could you want to fly look just fly fly like don't shake it around a whole bunch, just fly smooth, you know, just to make it enjoyable for me, you know, and, and, um, but, uh, most guys like left and right seat in the Kiowa, we would, we would mix it up really good. And, uh, cause you just, you just get bored and you want to just come off the controls for a little bit. Cause a, a normal mission for us would be, I would say a minimum of four hours. Um, but it, I think my longest was like nine or 10 hours in the seat one day. Yeah, forget boredom, man. You're just you're getting fatigued at that point. Yeah, and that, yeah, and that was a really um, like that was a, it was a big firefight going on uh, that particular day, and and um, uh, like ground guys had gotten themselves in trouble that day. Um, but uh, normally, you just you you mix it up, you know. Um, I think that particular one. Yeah, that. So I got to tell about the day now, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Love it. That particular one, we were just out conducting normal zone reconnaissance, just looking for anything um, uh, suspicious, and we got a call that a ground unit uh, in the Samara area of Iraq had been um, hit by an IED, and we we got called in to go support because whenever a unit gets hit with an IED, they become vulnerable because they have to provide first aid and they have to uh, recover the vehicle. And now they're consumed with that. So they're vulnerable to attacks from outside, right? So we come in and provide an outer layer of security for them in an aerial perspective. Um, so we responded, but the, I remember the, uh, I think it was probably the company commander or the battalion commander at the time, they had some fatalities and the battalion, it was either the battalion or the company commander for the infantry unit was upset, understandably, right? And he decided to pursue the individuals they believe were responsible for the ID into the village. There was sort of this, um, this was on the, uh, the Tigris River in Iraq. And this town was on a little peninsula that kind of jutted out into the Tigris River. So the so it really was almost like an island with only one way in, one way out, one road that jutted down this peninsula and a very deep, very wide river on all, all other three sides. So this infantry unit went straight down right into the middle and there were two story buildings left and right and in the back of the cul-de-sac and they drove right into an ambush. So they were in up armored vehicles. 
uh, buttoned up, getting shot at and grenades getting rolled down on them from all, all three sides from the buildings. So, um, so we immediately went in and uh, were able to, uh, each of these buildings had, um, there were stairs going up to the top and then there would be like a little, a smaller building, almost like a little outhouse up on top where the stairwell terminated. And that's where most of these guys were hiding once we showed up. So very quickly, we just identified those and were able to put rockets in each one of those. So those blew up, collapsed the stairwell. And then we went in a common tactic. And one, one of the best things about the Kiowa was the ability to get up close and personal. So back then we would just use M4s and the left seater would have the M4 uh, de-ringed into your, your harness here. So you don't drop it out the aircraft, right? And just looking down the side side of the barrel, just hold it diagonal and just go semi-auto on while the aircraft was in a tight left spiral over whatever it was. And you know, it's a very, very common tactic, but it was very, very effective too. Um, you had that top down look, you could immediately see where you were hitting and adjust really quickly to where you needed to be. And surprisingly, um, I mean, like to your point earlier, yeah, it does expose the aircraft, but I always kind of marveled how um, how ineffective the guys on the ground were, the enemy on the ground were, at being able to just point their rifle up at the sky and engage us. I, I almost, I think they sometimes gave us too much credit because sometimes you'd be over a guy with like an RPK or a PKM, a belt fed machine gun with a huge box of ammo on it. And they just look up at you almost in a with a deer in headlights look, and you you'll engage and 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 you know neutralize him with the M4. Well, I mean he's not moving, right? You're moving, you know. Yes, yes, with a with a belt fed machine gun, I'm sure he could lead it, but he might have just been like so worried about getting cover himself that maybe that's you know. I don't yeah, know. and often I mean you're you're talking about like split seconds here where when that aircraft breaks over that cover in that tight left or right, you, you, it'll be a left turn, tight left turn. You're looking straight down on whoever it is. Sometimes a group, two or three guys, sometimes an individual. A lot of times they're in the prone. So for them to get up and engage you is a little difficult. Um, so uh, but that, so we, we took care of the guys on the roof. And then I think at that point, the uh, that freed up the ground units to come out of their uh, out of their vehicles and start to get into these buildings. And we could see the cluster of buildings in the cul-de-sac out the back doors. Enemy were rushing out of the uh, the back doors of the buildings to flee into the woods towards the river. They got pushed out of the buildings. Um, and this is this is almost a like a helicopter pilot's dream is what this became. So there were a I remember we, so we started to widen our orbit as we saw these guys running through the this this uh, palm tree forest, and um, it was it was too sporadic and too thick to be able to just start spraying bullets down in there. I think we dropped a few rockets in, but it, you couldn't really see them all that well. But then when they got to the banks of the river, you could see them loading up and it was about five or six boats on the, on the edge of the river. And you're just like boats in the open. This is it. So, and it was, it was a straight part of the river there where they were loading up. So uh, both pilots lead and trail. And by this time we had a second scout weapons team coming into, so a total of four aircraft. And we just all lined up in a racetrack pattern. We'd come in on that final uh, leg, tip the nose down. <laughs> and just start dropping rockets right down on the boats. And I mean, there's no better target than a boat. Yeah. Where are they going to go on that river? Yeah. 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 So, so that was a really good day. We just dispatched those guys, protected the ground forces. They didn't believe it or not. The ground forces didn't lose anyone other than the two or three guys that they lost in the IED. Um, it was a really good day for my unit. It was, um, we were commended really well for the amount of time. That was a nine hour day at least. Um, and and the flying that we did fortunately the um that particular spot that little village where the battle took place was maybe a three or four minute flight from a fueling station that we just happened to have uh nearby on a highway oh, so you, were you guys just like hot fueling back and forth we, or, or? we would go single ship yeah so we, one guy would say hey man i need fuel okay i'd establish a high orbit the other guy would go back. We'd stay in radio communications with each other. He'd land, hot refuel, come back, replace me. And now we just bought ourselves another two and a half hours. 
Nice. Yeah, that's that's really convenient being that close to the fuel. Absolutely. Yeah, if you so if you um the infantry units can get in trouble when those fuel legs start to get stretched out. If you're gone for 10, 15, 20 minutes just to get fuel, it can turn the tide of the battle, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, and and yeah, and if you've got I mean depending on how remote these guys out, I mean it could even be longer than that that you're gone, you know, for gas. So, I mean, I, I would imagine with those long fuel legs, you're not doing that like one out one in type thing. You guys are both going together due to that flying that far. Yeah. For the further ones. Yeah. So, cause the, the biggest concern over there always was, um, that it, you always stay together and you don't want an aircraft going down because believe it or not, no matter where it goes down, if it's in a city, definitely. But even if it's in a rural area in Afghanistan or Iraq, um, people are going to come out of nowhere and they're going to come looking for Americans um to put on youtube you know and so if if your wingman went down um we all had five point harnesses on and you would uh, your sister ship would land um if they needed to jettison their weapon stores the machine gun and the rocket pods to lighten up weight and then if they you would either get out and help them get out if if they couldn't or they would the guys who went down would get out run in sit on the weapons pylon with their feet on their skids and snap link in and then you would exfiltrate them that way and then if you could secure the helicopter um, with ground forces, you would. If not, we would just have someone drop bombs on it and destroy it. So there's a story, I think, somewhere in there with a, it involves a grenade launcher. Can you go into that one? Which one's, <laughs> which one's the grenade launcher? I don't know. I could have sworn you told me something about shooting a grenade launcher at the side of the thing. But <laughs> the, So as the, as the tours went on, we, um, we started to get really creative with uh, – what we could do it started off with just smoke grenades and the um and using the m4 out the left side of the aircraft but later on um you know we we experimented with uh yeah the i forget the nomenclature of it but there was a, a single shot breech loader 40 millimeter grenade launcher that you could use out the left side of the aircraft um and also a chopped down m249 belt fed uh machine gun called the saw right uh, which was a 223 or 556 five, millimeter. Um, this came later on when in Afghanistan, it was, I think it was my fourth tour, and we were in the mountains of um, kind of Northeast Afghanistan. And the altitudes were high. Uh, the, I think the field elevation at the field I was at was 6,500 feet. And we were flying up to some places that were eight, nine, 10, 12,000 feet. I think the record I saw one day, 100 feet AGL, we were at 14,000 feet. And you guys are landing in these? No, not places? landing. Not oh, landing. man, I was like, damn, there's yeah. no way that the 407 would <laughs> No, not, not landing, but but conducting low-level reconnaissance, you know, up these valleys. And, and you look down, you're like, oh, my God, I'm at 14,000? It's time to turn around, you know, and you're stirring the pot at that point. But we would try to find ways to, to – um, in the summertime at those elevations, we were taking off with maybe 50 or 100 rounds of 50 cal on the main gun, and then maybe one or two rockets just for suppression, you know, and that's it. Because each rocket weighed about 25 pounds. I think a link, 100 rounds of 50 cal is about 25 pounds. Um, and the Kiowa was 5,200 pounds max. So uh, you just you just didn't have you know, fuel was the most precious resource we had. So in order to remain lethal, um, we thought, well, what could we do to kind of up the game from the left seat? Since that was, you know, uh, it was it was a more effective means of engaging these guys because sometimes the only shot you had, I mean, they would be tucked up into a little crevice somewhere between boulders or, or in a very, very tight little valley or, um, in an alley between buildings. You yeah, know? so straight and, and down very, is the only, yeah. Yeah, and it's very hard to pitch that aircraft over for a second, you know, go like 35 degrees nose down, you know, in order to get that shot. And then you're screaming in a high density altitude environment trying to recover from the dive too. And we actually, I know at least once or twice, we did have aircraft recovering from a dive, kind of bump at the ground and then smush the skids a little bit and then continue to fly too. So. Um, so the, the, the small arms from the left seat, um, was an experimental phase and it, um, but it was highly effective. I mean, uh, in, 
with that single shot 40 millimeter, um, you could easily put it through windows, put it through doors. I mean, you're just almost hovering, you know, just above, just stay above ETL into the wind and just give it a nice low pass in front of a building where you know there's a couple guys held up and just boop and just pop it right through the window or the door and that threat's neutralized. Other, otherwise, they could stay held up in there all day, you know. Um, we would ask, aside from the grenade launcher or the, um, or the, uh, the 249 saw, which was just much more effective, um, even just smoke grenades we would use if, let's say there was like a high value individual that um, we, we, there would be instances where intelligence would tell us that there was a person, a high value target on the ground. Um, and they knew that with a high degree of certainty. But we would go out and identify that group of people and they would flee into a building, say. And these buildings in Afghanistan, I mean, they're like two foot, three foot walls of ancient mud that's cured for like a thousand years. So small arms is not going through that stuff, you know, to get them out. And the infantry unit didn't want to go in, you know. So a lot of times we would just uh, literally just fly the aircraft straight at the door or the windows, um, uh, which a lot of these things, they just had a door opening, not an actual wood door on the front of it. Just fly the aircraft straight at the door and the left seater would have a smoke grenade with the pin pulled, kind of holding it against the door jam. And the left seater would say, okay, left, straight. Okay, right a little bit, straight. Okay, right there, that's good. And then open his hand and just release. And you know, at a hundred knots, that smoke grenade would go flying, maybe skip once or twice across the ground. And then go right into the building where you're looking for it to go. Oh, yeah. Nice. So you're and, using the forward velocity of the aircraft. Yeah, yeah. And we things. would, we would be when we would train this, and we would get highly effective with using these smoke grenades. I even know of a guy who we had a, a suspect fleeing on a motorcycle in the desert, and we um, escalation of force at that time allowed us to uh, conduct warning shots left and right in front of the individual, and he wasn't stopping to be detained. So they flew right alongside him and we're going to drop a smoke grenade in front of his path. But instead the smoke grenade hit him, I think in the, in his lower back, uh, going at about a hundred miles an hour Ooh. and knocked him off the bike, but, and then the ground unit stopped and detained him. So with a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of ingenuity, we were quite creative with, uh, very effective with the rifle and the, uh, really just the rifle and the smoke grenades were the number one thing used. I'm surprised they didn't get you guys like a milk or like a, you know, like a multi-shot uh, grenade launcher, like the revolver style. Yeah, it would be highly effective. Yeah. Cause the, the 275 rockets are good if you get a direct hit on like a vehicle or something, but against those structures and in fields and stuff too, they're not, they're not very effective. You need like a hard surface in order for them to be really, really good. So yeah, the, um, I mean, I, I remember one, one mission, we were flying up a route, <clears throat> just doing normal route reconnaissance and uh, a team of two. And um, this was like my fourth tour. And while we were flying up the route, we saw, um, uh, it was again, something shiny down below. And I told lead, I said, hey, come around again. Let's take a look in this little culvert over here. I saw something reflect, you know, in the desert where, so the rule was in Afghanistan, everything has value. A scrap piece of metal, has value, a plastic bucket has value. So nothing is ever left unless it has a purpose, you know? So something shiny in the desert, it's there for a reason. So we come back around on it, turns on it's a dirt bike laid on its side against two others with a camouflage tarp over it. Well, that's suspicious. So we, uh, we, uh, we conduct reconnaissance on that and there's this area of the route was heavily IED that led to a Navy SEAL base that was up in the mountains in this area. And, uh, and they would have problems getting with their supplies getting blown up while they were food and water and all that on the way up to them. So uh, we, um, uh, there were blown up vehicles left and right of the route. We immediately identified uh, two or three people underneath an old pickup truck bed on an upside down Afghan police vehicle on the side of the route. Okay. So there's three there. And then we widened our search a little bit and used the FLIR, oriented the FLIR site inward. And we could see the outlines of people laying on their sides or their stomachs uh, underneath burlap blankets. 
uh, or, or ponchos on the ground. And you could clearly see the outline of like a person's thigh and hip and shoulder on the ground. So we dropped, used the uh, 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 laser, uh, laser range finder and target designator and dropped coordinates on each one of them. And it turns out there were about eight or nine individuals down here. There were three in the middle on the, on the route. And then there were an additional one or two making a basically a, a square perimeter around this one site. So this was an ambush, you know, in waiting that we just happened upon and they were just hoping we would fly by and never see them. So I said, okay, everybody uh, just be cool. And all the three guys that I was with in, uh, between the two aircraft, this was all their first tour and really their first engagement. So I said, just be cool. Um, just fly around and we'll get, just go to bucket speed and get a nice high orbit. Pretend, don't fly like you're all excited and start flying over them to let them know that you see them. Just act normal. I said, the predicament here was it was summertime and we were at like 9,000 feet. So each aircraft only had 50 rounds and one rocket. So not very effective. So I said, okay, left seaters, get your rifles ready and put your bandolier, like have your magazines ready too, right? Um, and I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Lead aircraft, you're gonna go inbound from south to north and you're gonna engage that pickup truck bed with all of your 50 cal, your 50 rounds of 50 cal and your one rocket, one or two rockets. And I said, you're gonna be nervous. You're probably gonna miss because it's real, the aircraft's high altitude, it's kind of loosey goosey. You're probably gonna miss because um, that's fine. If you do, I'll come in, I'll try to get it with my 50 and my one or two rockets, right? After that, we're gonna peel off to the upper left. You're gonna do tight left circles. You'll be low, I'll be high. And we're gonna take care of the two guys up there, right? In the upper left. Once that's complete and you've neutralized them, we're gonna shift over to the upper right, tight left, up uh, high and low, and then lower right and then lower left. And we're gonna repeat that process until each one of those quadrants is complete using the M4. If at any point you feel like um, you're threatened or he's got a good beat on you, peel off and I'll engage him from up high, you know, above you. So we're both doing tight left orbits one over the other. So we did that, we went inbound, um, got close on the pickup truck bed um, and then um, enough to, um, to uh, either concuss or to wound those guys. Um, it actually flipped the bed over and they seemed injured enough. And then we did the tight spirals over each one and I, uh, I, I remember one of them, it was, it was, so I think all of them were wearing um, throat mics. So they were, uh, they were all on internal comms with each other. And I think saying just lay low. So when the first rounds went off, there was some confusion. And then I think when they lost communication or had some communication with the guys in the upper left, they started to gain situational awareness of what we were doing. And because they were pretty far apart, these these areas, and you know, a couple hundred meters. And um, by the time we got to the second group, a guy, I remember I was stacked high above the lower ship. It was just like in the movies almost. This guy flung this camouflage tarp off of him and he had an RPG. And all I remember, I remember over the radio, lead saying, RPG, 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 you know, and he peeled off. And my, um, my uh, left seater was uh, W2. Uh, I'll keep his name out of it, but great guy. He, um, he was my supply book officer also. Um, so really great guy. He was just all American. He laid into that guy with his M4, with everything he had, the entire, he had an extended magazine in there, the whole magazine. And uh, actually he had one of those like 75 round ones. Oh, where it yeah. Over on both sides. Yeah. yeah. Laid into that whole thing in there took them out and then, uh, and then we resumed normal responsibilities high and low after that. Uh, we actually got all of the guys, neutralized all eight to 10 of them. And uh, it just so happened that my battalion commander was in a flight of two UH 60s conducting a tour of the battlefield for a general or something in the area. So he said, hey, Steve, what's, uh, what's going on over there? You guys, you guys into something? I said, yes, yes, we are. And, and uh, anything you can do to help, that would be really appreciated. You know, he said, okay. So he went up to the Navy SEAL base, kicked the general off, off the flight, had him go mingle on the base for a little bit, took the SEALs came out with pajamas and flip flops on and their racks and landed on scene and did site exploitation, collected intelligence, photographed everything. 
and then left. And then, but the one problem was, is there was a lot of IED material on the ground there, bomb making material. And there was a lot of weapons and radios and everything too. They, they didn't take anything. They just took it like maps and journals and that type of stuff. I think they did biometrics on the guys too. Um, but there was all this stuff left on, on the route and the adjacent areas. So, um, so we actually, we, uh, we called in uh, 155 artillery fire on the route to destroy all the IED equipment down there. And then we called in, there was some A-10s orbiting above. And we called in uh, laser guided JDAMs on each one of the little four quadrants right on the guys to destroy their equipment too. So that was a pretty glorious day. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was, yeah, we um we went back and, you know, it's probably like a, we, we could not have been lighter on fuel at that point. That was all in within a single bag of gas too. Oh, wow. Yeah, no refuel. And um, I mean, we were milking that, that max endurance speed in the orbit, you know, and uh, we got home and it was, and met at the nose of the aircraft and it was like, wow, did that just happen? That was, that was an interesting Sunday, you know, and, and um, the, uh, the guy I flew with, he actually scraped the uh, brass out of his, um, out of the chin bubble of the aircraft and uh, said he was going to send it home to his dad to make into some spurs for for the cavalry yeah or, or some sort of brass ornaments you know so he was pretty excited about that but that was you know it was a good it was a good day turn well no never mind some stuff i have to not disclose yeah 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 <laughs> that's, that's cool so at this point you're you're like the senior salty guy yeah I, I was i was the uh the company commander or the troop commander at that point i was a captain for that particular tour yeah how many flight hours are you logging per deployment here i mean you're probably racking them up pretty good huh yeah, I think a standard for like a commission guy like me, you would get between um, maybe 500 or 900. Um, a warrant could easily get between 800 or 1,000, I think. That's a lot of hours. I mean, even like in the civilian side, without all that extra mission planning stuff, that's a lot of hours. Yeah, it is. I mean, you're flying four or five days a week. Um, the average mission, I, I think for for a Kiowa or an Apache guy, it, the average mission is is minimum four hours, minimum. Um, and uh, you'll you'll go out and b burn two bags of gas easy, you know. Um, so it it racks up pretty quick. And usually, even when you're overseas, you'll get two days of non flying duties where you kind of catch up on whatever your additional duties are for the office. So for the commission guys, I mean, there's always that. So that's kind of a hot topic, right? Is oh. RLOs don't get to fly as much as, as warrants do. That's why I'm going to go warrant, you know, and it's really, I think it's, it's really a personal choice and a, and a uh, career choice. So I flew, I had no problem. I mean, I, I, I left the army with 4,000 hours and I was pretty happy with that. I, I think I was, um, flew just as much as the other guys. I was happy flying five days a week all the time. Even when I was a company commander, when I was a battalion intelligence officer, when I was a, um, even when I was a, uh, an S3, you know, the operations officer for the battalion, um, you have to, you have a primary job as your administrative job as a commissioned officer. Um, and flying is sometimes seen as kind of extra. So like, it's the standard dilemma, right? Like you can do, you can only do like maybe one thing really, really good, you know? And the more you spread yourself out, you're going to suffer in probably quality in other areas. So to me, the flying was always the passion, you know? Sure. Yeah. I don't think much people have the passion for the admin and the paperwork, you know, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Some people do. Some people do. Yeah. There are people you, they, so usually the W4 standards pilot would come up to the company commander or the staff officer or the major uh, working on staff and be like, sir, it's been like, it's been like 89 days. We got it. We got to go fly. You got to go get in the aircraft. Just we'll go fly around the base. We'll go fly over to brigade headquarters. You can go say hi to everybody over there and then we'll fly back and then you'll be good. It's like your goggle on current. You're, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So w walk us through that sad day that uh, the Kiowa was becoming no more and you had to, you had to change airframes. Oh, I mean, so I wasn't, I wasn't in an active flying unit at the time. And I can only imagine how hard it was for those guys then. But so I think when they killed the Kiowa, I was in uh, command and staff school in Quantico, Virginia, which is like a normal higher education course you have to go to 
based off of your rank and time in the army. Um, so I just heard about it, you know, and it's like, but, but it was a little bit of panic too. Cause here I was a, a, my whole career had been Kiowa and I know, and I was knew I was going back to a Kiowa unit. Um, but not anymore. So, um, there was a lot of panic. I, I, from my perspective, um, it seems like it was every, everything was really divided into thirds. So a third of the folks warrant and commission were thanked for their service and, you know, good luck in civilian life. And we're sorry, but thank you for your service. And, um, the other third were said, Hey, you know, we, you can't fly Kiowas, but you're more than welcome to become an intelligence officer or a logistics officer or, uh, going to UAVs, you know, so unmanned stuff started to become uh, more popular. And then the last third were offered transitions. Um, at the time, the the Apaches were only offered initially because the thinking was, well, that the mission set directly transfers over reconnaissance and security and attack operations. So a good Kiowa pilot could make an okay Apache pilot, right? That would be the joke, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so I was, I, I was, it, there was a DA board held and, um, and I was given orders to go to the Apache course. And that was, that was, uh, that was a tough transition. I mean, it's, um, it's kind of like, probably like the first day you showed up to start your airplane private pilot, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, everything's new, but it's not new, but it's still like, yeah, like you're a really experienced pilot. Like, hey, you want to see a zero airspeed auto? I can do that, you know, or versus how do I take this thing off? You know? Yeah, going from really experienced to like, oh, I'm the new guy now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you really have to humble yourself. I, I remember I, I, when I showed up to Fort Rucker for the Apache course, it was supposed to be a three month course. It ended up being a six month course um, just due to delays and maintenance and manpower and all that. Um, but it was me and about 12 other um captains majors and probably like w3s w4s you know and we were all in it together you know we realized what a tough transition this would be the instructors that we were given who were all apache guys they were all really um accommodating <clears throat> they you know they understood like what a what a kick in the gut that must be to have to spend your whole career understanding how to fly and how to operate and how to how to how to run a unit of these these aircraft and now you're switching so um it was some guys took right to it hey new airframe i'm really excited i struggled with it a bit um the uh um because for me the passion was always in uh being close to the ground unit flying down low really being that low level scout pilot um and uh um just not you know not system oriented eyes outside the aircraft um and just you know in touch with the ground and the enemy and the infantry unit and everything so the apache is just it's an amazing machine um but i i felt like a lot of it was just it's just so system oriented um you've got the eye hads on your right eye um, which displays every parameter about the aircraft or the weapons or navigation you can want. Um, initially, you have to learn how to <clears throat> how to split your brain, how the right eye is processing one set of information while the left eye is in the unaided, uh, non-information world, and you deal with that. Um, is that is that cause like headaches and stuff like you know going through that? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I bet that's a I bet that's a tough. Uh, thing because I've, I've heard a lot about that that you know yeah it's like your you know your brain is split up into two different halves and you know one is getting completely different info than the other side and that's it's a lot to process oh yeah they'll i mean when you get in that uh that aircraft for the first time the first thing you'll you'll notice in the front seat is uh you know the a stack of uh vomit bags uh there on the little on the little uh, right where the charts are supposed to be it's a it's a stack of vomit bags or air sickness bags and they'll tell you hey if you got a puke uh you know major don't don't puke in here you know like puke in the bag and then let's open up the canopy let me know all the controls but yeah you will absolutely get sick um and a lot of people it'll uh, you'll wash out during that that phase too they call it ironically they call it the bag phase 
not because of the, the air sickness bag. They call it that because they'll, um, to really teach you how to fly off of the system, they'll take uh, blackout curtains and Velcro them in the entire, so you can't see anything outside of the windows of the front half of the aircraft. And you'll get in, start it up. Your only reference to the outside world is that teeny tiny little TV screen in front of your right eye. And the camera that's feeding the information that you, or the image that you see is five feet in front of your feet on the nose of the aircraft. And super low too. So yeah. yeah and, and lower too. Yeah. So you're, uh, I mean, just to start the aircraft and even just to get it light and then start to ground taxi forward and then turn on the lines around the airfield, you'll start off like that is just, it's tough. It's very, very tough, but you're, you know, the human brain's amazing and, it, and you adapt to it. So it kind of makes me think of the sim. I, I just got back from flight safety and it's like the same thing you pick up in immediately. Cause it's like the, I don't care how expensive and nice your helicopter sim is. There's going to be some kind of delay or something that just, you know, it didn't get sick, but I feel like it takes a, a day or two to recover from that being in the sim. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. 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 And guys, I don't, I don't know what the washout rate is, but there, there is a washout rate for the bag phase. And they even, the instructors will tell you if you make it through that, uh, the bag phase, then you'll be good for the rest of the course. So, but I, I did, I really did enjoy the Apache for, um, being up in the front seat, um, you know, and being the primary scanner and shooter for that gun, uh, the 30 millimeter gun. Um, I mean, that's, there's, it, what an amazing piece of hardware that is. I mean, you could pick out, um, pick out targets, you know, three, four or 5,000 meters away and just be lobbing 30 millimeter shells, um, you know, right out there and hitting pretty accurately. And also the ability to get um, Hellfire missiles off the rail um, quickly and accurately was just incredible. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, what an amazing killing machine that thing is. Did you deploy with the Apache? Cause this was pretty late in your career. I did. Yeah, I did my last tour. I was the, uh, I was the S3 for 1st Battalion, 101st Airborne, um, and we deployed to Afghanistan, uh, and I was in the Apache for that. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, there were like a couple of small engagements, um, but the, the, uh, the Apache, I mean, you really, it's almost, for me, there are exceptions, but um, it's, it's treated more of a, like a close air support uh, function almost like an A-10 would be, and less as a, the Kiowa was more of a maneuver unit in support of, you know, the ground forces on the ground, almost treated like, um, like a tank or a, or a, uh, heavy machine gun on the battle field would be, you know, it's part of the fight on the ground. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure in the patch, you, you probably felt a lot more separated from the, from the battle or the fight, right. You know, because you're farther away and yeah. And everything, every, almost everything you see is through the image or, or through the screen in front of you. Um, and you're shooting at such long distances, which is great um, for the, uh, it just has great range and great accuracy, but, um, but you do feel sort of detached, you know, um, a little bit. Yeah. I'd imagine looking through that as opposed to like, you know, flying and looking with your eyes, it kind of, does it almost feel like you're almost not, you forget that you're actually there. You're just kind of looking through some obscure thing right yeah well the way video games are now you can almost simulate all i mean there's plenty of video games where you're flying a you know ac-130 gunship or something too and it's it's similar to that you know where you're just chunking rounds on a green screen you know so um yeah it was it was uh the last tour was interesting i actually um my last tour in afghanistan was uh out of jalalabad where i went Ironically, that was my first tour in Afghanistan. So I think the same building I was in 15 years prior was the building the, the building I would finish up in. And I could see like, hey, see that desk over there? I built that desk out of plywood 15 years ago here when I was a lieutenant, you know, so or whatever, you know. I'm sure the ROE from 2005 to 2020, it was a pretty different experience. Uh you know, in, in different engagements or whatever that you're doing over there as far as, because I mean, 05, you're like a cowboy, you know, over there kind of, especially in the Kiowa and then going back in 20, you know, in the Apache, probably kind of limited. Well, the, like OIF one, you know, five, or um, it really was OIF two, you know, <clears throat> it was the remnants of the Republican guard figuring out how to 
form an insurgency and us developing tactics, aerial tactics to try to counter that. Um, all the way to at the height in 2009, 2010, it was full on air to ground engagement against very savvy, uh, very smart, very elusive uh, ground forces of really Taliban at that point. Um, and this is really where we came up with all, you know, using the 40 millimeter and the 249 and smoke grenades and the M4 and even uh, manned unmanned teaming. So we would fly into some area and then fly out, but then leave a UAV overhead at 10,000 feet staring at the ground. And then we would be in radio contact with the UAV operator and he would let us know the second they creeped out of the woodwork. So, and we would go back and strike. Yeah. And then the last tour, the, um, it evolved to uh, the U.S. really being hands off and the Afghan forces were um, supported by us with intelligence, with close air support, with indirect fire support, and if need be, Apache gunships uh, if they got into a pinch. So we would say, OK, guys, go go out, go fight, go go do your thing for your country. And uh, we would monitor them. Actually, every single Afghan truck, tank, every Afghan soldier would have a little GPS sender on his shoulder or his helmet, and we would track them uh, on a screen. So just like a, um, what is it, a little Apple Apple AirPod or yeah, AirTag, yeah, yeah, AirTag, <laughs> yeah. basically an AirTag, and we would monitor and um, and uh, and track the battle way and be there to support if they if they needed help. So um, really interesting to kind of see the whole. Um, evolution of the fight and then the evolution of how helicopters were used in that over the span of what for me eight, 18 years i think you know i hate to move away from the military stories because these are <laughs> they're so interesting but they could go and, forever and, yeah. yeah i know i know in all in all this time so you obviously came out um with tons of hours so you could kind of really kind of do any helicopter job you wanted which from some of the other guys, I mean, I I talked to, I remember captains coming through with 10, 12 years and they had like 750 hours, flight hours, you know, that, which is tough because if you're trying to transition to a civilian flying job, helicopter wise, there's really not much, you know. Um, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the skill bridge program that, uh, you know, I thought was pretty cool that you utilized, um, especially for guys, you know, getting out, uh, specifically pilots, you know, and, and kind of, let's just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I was... Uh, in my final assignment was in Austin, Texas, and um, where I would finally retire. And I think uh, it started off. I think my my wife said uh, it was for either my birthday. I think it was my birthday or Father's Day. She said, uh, "What do you want to do?" I'm like, "I'd love to get back in a helicopter because I haven't been in a helicopter in in a year, year and a half, maybe." And she took me down. I I met you for the first time, and you and I went on a discovery flight, and I think we talked about opera. That was really one of my first um, interactions, like delving into helicopter general aviation, you know, and you, you gave me an idea of what some of the options are and the CFI and double I route and all that. And um, I went back and discovered that the army had the, um, the skill bridge program, which any soldier getting out officer warrant enlisted, um, you can sign up for up to a six month internship, um, six months from your final out date. So a misconception is that you have to pick from the list of companies that they give you. Um, what I discovered talking to this really helpful retired Sergeant Major out of Fort Hood um, is no, you can pick any company that you want. And uh, turns out uh, 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 Veracity was willing to take me on board. So I put in the application and for six months, even though I was a active duty officer in the U.S. Army, I reported to work at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Seguin, Texas, Veracity's headquarters. And, uh, and then I think, I think I did what, um, uh, three days a week at Seguin and then, and then two days a week at, uh, at Georgetown uh, base, right? And, um, during that time, I was using the GI Bill and working on the CFI and double I, and then immediately went into a um, flight instructor position at, uh, at Georgetown, really both for a little while. Yeah. I mean, that was a tough sell. It's, uh, you know, to to the owner, you know, it's like, do you want a free CFI? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, 
it, I mean, and but the thing is, it works out for the company. It works out for the soldier. Um, the, uh, I mean, I guess it works out for the army too, because they get a smooth transition into civilian life too. Um, but I mean, I was still receiving a, um, a full, my full paycheck every month from the army. And all I had to do was check in once a month, uh, via phone with my supervisor. And they asked me if everything was going okay. Well, I mean, it was, it was almost too good to be true that the army would offer a program like that. It's, it's funny too, because I had a, uh, retiring warrant officer literally come see me at work, um, just two days ago. He just stopped in randomly to see, to ask about HEMS um at the base here and uh and i told him about skillbridge and he's looking into it man it's it's really great especially like you're saying on the general officer route you know towards the end of your career you probably haven't been flying a lot if at all so to not only like you know help transition but also get get some more civilian experience get some recent uh helicopter experience which i think is very important because some of these jobs if if you don't have commercial uh experience within a certain time frame <laughs> you're not getting hired on, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter if you got all this time, but the last time you flew was four years ago or three years ago. Yeah. And you know, one thing I talk to army guys about a lot too is, is, um, the army does a great job at teaching you the aircraft and, uh, multi-ship or tactical flight training, or even flying on your base, you know, or flying overseas. But as far as, and, and you know, as well as I do, like most army guys, especially I would say, OH-58 or, uh, or, or Apache guys don't really know general aviation flying all that well. They may think they do, but they really don't. You know, there may be the occasional, uh, oh, let's, let's fly from the, from the Army base to the non-towered airport 20 miles away and then back, you know, and, and that'll, be, that'll be it for the, for the quarter. But it's nothing like to, to prepare you as a commercial pilot. Yeah. So, you know, going the CFI route and, and teaching new people and being able to just kind of like, you know, talk about freedom to, you know, we, we were a 141 program, so we did have a strict syllabus. But as far as like, there's a lot of interpretation, a lot of freedom you can go to enhance that and change that experience. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you're an EMS now. I'm sure that helped you for that transition from military to EMS to, yeah, to get that civilian kind of instruction training, right? Cause I, I talked to a lot of guys, yeah, that we see them come in where they go, they come straight out of the military. I mean, like literally a month ago they, you know, they were active duty and now they're starting an EMS. I'd imagine that that's a tough transition to go that change that much, you know? Yeah. Well, cause one, you're, you're not used to flying alone in the army. You, uh, I've known guys when they go into EMS or you've probably seen them, they come out of the army. The first time they're soloing is when you're putting them through the CFI course, you know, or to build hours or whatever. Um, and then, and just, just knowing, knowing how to navigate uh, commercial airspace, you know, cause in, in, in the army, you've got, you get your weather from an air force weather officer. You don't have to, you don't hunt for it on aviationweather.gov or wherever else you get it. Um, you don't really know about for flight that much, at least during my era, we didn't, um, you uh, you'll receive what you're going to do and where you're going to go from the operations officer. He's going to tell you what your training event is, and you'll more than likely do it in your backyard at the army base, right there on the reservation. So, which is kind of, I mean, we don't, you know, in EMS, we do get the the mission, if you will, as far as like, hey, you're going to go here, you're going to go here, blah blah blah. But as far as weather, like that's fully on you to go find and make the decision on. And I mean, you, we have our med crew, but I mean legally as far as pilots are concerned they're not really crew members as far as responsibilities in the aircraft you know they they do they do help and augment us but you don't have another pilot in the seat next to you for the for, in most operations that you can at least even if you're the senior guy that can at least be like hey you know are we sure about this or it just you know this is a little second voice if you will kind of in the conversation because you know in the in the military when you were like the the senior guy in the aircraft did you ever have you know, times where maybe the less senior guy kind of um, brought up something that maybe you weren't thinking about as far as decision making or, you know, planning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, so, I mean, just like we have uh, crew coordination and civilian flying, there's crew coordination and military flying too. And one of the things always was, um, I remember from the checklist of items was excessive professional courtesy. So even if you're flying with like a full bird colonel is your right seater, you know, like if he does, you feel like he isn't aware of something and needs to know you, if you're a Lieutenant, you 
hey sir you're you're aware of this right like you you see that tower there right yeah because that's that's almost a dangerous kind of thing you know especially on the I know on the airline side, it was real is real big, and especially in other countries where it's like you don't question the captain, period. And I mean, that led to some crashed aircraft, you know? So the wolf pack will always keep you straight, though, too. And by the wolf pack, it's the Warren Officer Liberation Front. So they, <laughs> the, you know, a W-1 to the unit would probably fall victim to that. But very quickly, in what, three or six months, he'll pin his W-2, and his brothers will tell him, hey, man, like, like, you know, you just you just do what you got to do to make sure the aircraft's safe, you know, and they know like if they're flying with the platoon leader or the company commander or the major at battalion or the colonel, you're a crew and you're both equal in the cockpit. Yeah, I'm sure there's some senior officers that maybe, you know, don't jive with that. But I'm sure most people that are in aviation, they kind of get that, that like, hey, we're all here for general security and we all want to make it back, you know, in the aircraft. Yeah. And to be quite honest, like when when so brutal honesty right um in the army i mean as a commissioned officer um you're more than more than often you're seen as a lesser proficient pilot right just because you have other duties you're not in the cockpit that much The, the warrant officer is seen as the more proficient pilot he's in it every day that's 90 percent of his job and what he's doing very rarely you'll have um because like i said earlier you'll have you'll have commission guys who fly once a month you'll have some that'll fly you know twice a week you know um so it's really up to them how proficient they want to be um if they're seeing it as just check the currency block or actually i want to be like really really proficient at this and you get you get all different types but the warrant officers will always always um you know, keep that, keep that straight. I mean, if you have, if you're behind the aircraft and, you know, and you're hanging on to the, to the, to the vertical stage, you know, like, like they're going to let you know, like, Hey, you know what, sir, I got the controls. Like this flight's over, like we're heading back, you know, and that, and that, and that, nobody would ever challenge that. That'll be, you know, like, Hey man, you're, you're right. You know, I'm sorry. You're right. You know? So I was, I was behind. I'm sorry. You know? Well, all good things must come to an end. It's been about an hour and a half now, and I've had a blast. There's some awesome stories in there. Steven, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was, it's was it been really great having you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. It was good to, uh, to share all those stories, and hopefully um, some of the stuff that we've rambled on about could be helpful to someone. And for everybody else, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. The next video coming up in the pipeline is our part two of our trip from Canada to Brazil. If you didn't get the first one, check that out, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.